To halt this offensive buildup. Three people, a president, a revolutionary, and a reporter. For a moment, they seem to hold the fate of the world in their hands. These three came together in the shadow of a terrible possibility. Cuba stood ready to become the flashpoint for World War III. Fidel Castro, Cuba's leader, was a symbol of everything the United States feared. American President John F. Kennedy publicly denounced Castro and plotted to topple him. But newly uncovered documents reveal Kennedy and Castro were secretly reaching out to each other. And the catalyst was Lisa Howard, a pioneering journalist all but forgotten today. Only now has this secret history been revealed, and Lisa Howard can begin to claim her legacy. Lisa Howard began life as Dorothy Guggenheim. At 17, she left small town Ohio to be an actress and changed her name. Lisa Howard quickly achieved success in New York as a soap opera star. I'm a woman. Oh, I'm ambitious to a point. But not like you, not like most men. I'm content, or at least I have been. Her specialty was the evil vixen who let nothing stand in her way. But there was another side to Howard. In her spare time, she wrote earnest articles for obscure political magazines. If wanting to eliminate ugly slums, if wanting to create real prosperity shared by all is un-American, well, I'm quite guilty. In 1959, Howard reinvented herself again. This is Lisa Howard of Mutual News. This time as a radio journalist. To those who knew her, it came as no surprise. I mean, there was no door that locked or unlocked that could ever stop Lisa from moving into where she wanted to go. And she was terribly involved with public issues, political issues, international issues. She wouldn't take no for an answer. And she was so sure that you would be interested in her, that it was irresistible. Senator. By 1960, she was covering a Massachusetts senator running for president, John F. Kennedy. emerged as the chief issue of this campaign. The issue is between those who are satisfied with things as they are and those who wish to move ahead. And in my judgment, It wouldn't be the last time Howard's and Kennedy's paths would cross. At the heart of the presidential campaign was the issue that would later draw them together, Cuba and the man who would become inseparable with the image of that country, Fidel Castro. Castro's power came from the Cuban people's desire to escape a corrupt dictator, Fulgencio Batista. He had invited U.S. corporations to divide up the island, and American gangsters to control the world-famous casinos. Cuba was ripe for revolution. In November of 1956, Fidel Castro, then a young lawyer, slipped into Cuba's Sierra Maestra Mountains with a few armed followers. He was an organizational genius who knew how to get his message out, even setting up a radio station in the middle of the jungle, and smuggling in a New York Times reporter. Just two years later, Castro led an army of 50,000 into Havana, and Batista fled. It was an explosion of joy. The feelings of happiness and, and relief that finally we get rid of that regime. We've got our national dignity. We've got independence. For the first time, it was the people themselves that felt as being a protagonist of, of, of history. That was the most important week in our history.
The revolution's effects were soon felt. Private property was seized. American corporations were nationalized. And Castro moved closer to the Soviet bloc. Under President Eisenhower, American opposition to Castro hardened. President Eisenhower announces that Cuba's assigned share of the United States sugar market has been cut by 95 percent. The there were trade sanctions, and the CIA recommended thorough consideration be given to the elimination of Fidel Castro. And the report continued. Many informed people believe the disappearance of Fidel would greatly accelerate the fall of the present government. to the people in the fall, and we shall... After winning the 1960 Democratic Convention, presidential candidate John F. Kennedy discovered the American public was deeply concerned about Cuba. Every night, Kennedy would speak at a different state and take questions for 30 minutes, and people would submit all the questions on cards, not to show them to Kennedy in advance, but so we could just get a fair distribution of interest. But afterwards, when we got on the plane, I would always go through them all. And I found that everywhere in the country you went, the single biggest number of foreign policy questions concerned Cuba. And that was clearly even greater than peace and Khrushchev and all the rest. Cuba was the, the major foreign policy issue. ABC News saying good evening from New York, where the two major candidates for president of the United States are about to... Kennedy used the Cuba form. issue to attack his opponent, Richard campaign. Nixon. Castro is only the beginning of our difficulties throughout Latin America. The big struggle will be to prevent the influence of Castro spreading to other countries. Mexico, Panama, Brazil. Kennedy's Bolivia, strategy Columbia. worked. In January 1961, he assumed the presidency. In his inaugural address, he vowed to keep the Americas free of Soviet influence. Let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas. And let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house. But what the American public didn't know was that Kennedy had also inherited the outgoing president's solution to the problem of Cuba. In secret camps, the CIA was training Cuban exiles for an invasion of the island. Eisenhower, the day before the inauguration, uh, urged Kennedy to continue this policy. Just a few months later, the invasion began. The landing at the Bay of Pigs was meant to be a surprise, but Castro knew it was coming. Cuban intelligence knew that an invasion was coming. And that there were people being trained in camps in Guatemala and Nicaragua. The CIA expected the Cubans to rise in support of their exile liberators. Instead, they fought back the invasion. Castro personally directed the defense of the island. The United States refused to acknowledge involvement with the invasion publicly, a policy that left the invaders stranded. The rebels did, of course, get in trouble on the beach. They were on the verge of being wiped out. There was U.S. naval aircraft uh, within range of that beach. The chiefs and the CIA pleaded for the president to allow the use of that airplane. And he said, no, I'm not going to initiate a war with Cuba. The battle was soon over. 114 invaders were killed and over 1,000 taken prisoner. When questioned, Kennedy yeah. could not admit what the press already knew. United States involvement with the invasion. He looked weak and confused. I'm not to uh, conceal responsibility because I'm the responsible officer of the government, but merely because I, uh, and that is quite obvious, but merely because I do not uh, believe that uh, such a discussion uh, would benefit us during uh, the present uh, difficult uh, situation. 
I think it would probably hit John Kennedy harder than anything else in his presidency. The victory at the Bay of Pigs helped consolidate the Cuban Revolution. This was the first defeat of the United States in Latin America. For Castro, the Bay of Pigs was a triumph. Every journalist in the world wanted to interview the charismatic revolutionary who had defeated the United States, including Lisa Howard. Lisa Howard was a woman ahead of her time. Moving quickly from radio to television journalism, she broke new ground. Purex presents Lisa Howard and News with the Woman's Touch. An ABC correspondent, she was the only woman in television with her own news show. Alabama's Governor Wallace has again defied the federal government. The governor blocked school integration in three cities. Howard today covered all the major news stories. They criticize you for maintaining a fantastically high standard of living. But her special talent was getting interviews with world leaders. Women were on television, but they were in underling positions. The man was always the host, the main person. Uh, and to have a program of your own, however brief, was some sort of a miracle. She wasn't what we'd call an investigative reporter. She was a personality reporter. And there was a quality of fierceness when she wanted to know somebody. Whoever it was, she nailed them. And the people she wanted to know were, of course, the most important political people and statesmen in the world at that time. She had made her television reputation in Vienna, Austria, where Kennedy was going face to face with the leader of the Soviet bloc, Nikita Khrushchev. He's shaking hands with it was only six Nicola. weeks after the Cuban invasion. In the Howard Nicola. cornered an amused Khrushchev. Using Foreign Minister Gromyko as an impromptu translator, she got her interview. Howard had interviewed Kennedy and Khrushchev. Now she set her sights on Fidel Castro. But Castro was becoming difficult to reach, as he depended more and more on Russia for support. Just 90 miles off the coast of Florida, Cuba provided the Soviets with a toehold in the Western Hemisphere. For the world, the stakes were becoming very high. The Cold War was in a sense, in a real sense, a hot war for the seven years I was secretary. It was 24 hours a day. With every one of those days, a concern that if either side moved to military action, it would end with an exchange of nuclear weapons. Kennedy and his advisors were obsessed with Cuba. Using the CIA's resources, they launched Operation Mongoose, a covert program of sabotage against Cuba. Mongoose was, quote unquote, to get rid of Castro and the Castro regime. And when I asked my boss what does get rid of mean, all he said was, Sam, you, know, you can read the English language, you know what that means. Guns were shipped to anti-Castro activists. Factories and sugar warehouses were blown up and burned. The candidates hope for what we now call a regime change in Cuba. And there is an ambiguity about the word removal. Remove Castro from power or remove him from life. There were plans to kill Fidel with snipers, exploding seashells, even poisoned cigars. Ultimately, Operation Mongoose failed in its objective to overthrow Fidel Castro. But it did have one great unexpected success. A source deep in the countryside noticed unusual military activity. Subsequent overflights revealed Russian nuclear missiles in place and space being prepared for more. It was the beginning of the Cuban Missile Crisis. We now know that the Soviet Union has decided to transform Cuba into a base 
for communist aggression into a base for putting all of the Americas under the nuclear gun. Kennedy ordered a blockade of Russian weapons shipments to Cuba. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara was ready for war. I have taken the necessary steps to deploy our forces to be in a position to make effective the quarantine. There were, we thought, 90 intercontinental range missiles there have targeted on, on the U.S. Uh, East Coast, endangering the lives of 90 million Americans. Russian ships, loaded with weapons, held their course for the blockade line. And the Cubans prepared for another American invasion. It was a battle of nerves, and Kennedy was willing to press the nuclear button. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. We had a huge invasion force a huge invasion plan. The first day's airstrikes were to, I think, the 1080 sorties. We had 180,000 troops mobilized, ready to invade Cuba. The chiefs recommended at 4.30 p.m. on Saturday, October 27th, that we initiate the, the air attack within about a day and a half. And they did it because, at that time, we didn't believe the missiles were operational. We didn't believe the nuclear warheads for those missiles had yet been delivered to Cuba. We didn't know until 29 years later, in January 1992, that at that moment, there were on the order of 170 nuclear warheads on the soil of Cuba. If we had launched that attack without any question, there would have been nuclear war. And we were that close. At the very last moment, Khrushchev and Kennedy negotiated a settlement. Castro was left out of the negotiations. He heard about the agreement on the radio. When the Russians pulled out the missiles, they didn't go for permission, they just did it. Clearly, they were in charge. So Castro had been weakened, and Kennedy just won a huge victory, maybe the biggest of his administration. In Miami, Kennedy brandished a banner from the Bay of Pigs invasion and declared it would soon fly over a free Havana. But behind the scenes, a very different vision of U.S.-Cuban relations was taking shape. In the aftermath of the missile crisis, we understood that Castro and Khrushchev had possibly reached the parting of the ways. If he could persuade Fidel Castro to shift his allegiance. This would be a great blow to the Soviet Union and a great political triumph for, for Kennedy. Some close to Kennedy saw an extraordinary opportunity. One White House advisor, Gordon Chase, suggested. The sweet approach, the other side of the coin, quietly enticing Castro over to us. Senator Barry Goldwater launched a cross-country speaking tour... It was the same approach that Lisa Howard had been using for over a year. She had sent letter after letter to Castro, begging for an interview. Dear Premier Castro, I wish to do a filmed television interview with you. She was sending notes to Castro. She was working every angle. I mean, the joke around our house was Lisa calls at midnight. And the calls, a great many of them were, were related to her fierce ambition to get to see Fidel Castro. And she was determined to do it and nothing was gonna stop her. Ironically, the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis would help Lisa Howard realize her ambition. The return of the captives. At Homestead Air Force Base near Miami, the first of the prisoners ransomed from Castro take the short walk down the gangway to freedom. In December 1962, 
New York lawyer James Donovan negotiated the release of Cuban prisoners still being held from the Bay of Pigs invasion. John Nolan worked closely with Donovan in Cuba. They spent a lot of time with Fidel Castro. We did talk about better relations between Cuba and the United States. It was a theme, you might say, that underlay uh, much of our conversation with Castro. In the spring of 1963, Donovan went back to Cuba to negotiate the release of American citizens trapped on the island. A staff memo made clear Kennedy saw the relationship between Castro and Donovan as an opportunity. We should start thinking along more flexible lines. We may want to give Donovan some flies to dangle in front of Castro. The president himself is very interested in this one. In April, Castro took Donovan scuba diving at the Bay of Pigs. Castro says, Senor Donovan, if the United States and Cuba develop a better working relationship, how would we do that? And Donovan's response to that question was, Premier, if that were to come about, it should be done like porcupines make love, very, very carefully. <laughs> Both Castro and Kennedy believed in the possibility of accommodation, but keeping the dialogue going was tricky. They needed a go-between someone who could communicate effectively with both sides. Into this political vacuum stepped Lisa Howard. She was in the Riviera Hotel in Havana. It was the high point of her career. She had finally gotten permission to interview Fidel Castro. The people of the United States understand my English. I think they will. <laughs> Dr. Castro, do you feel there is any basis for a return to normal relations with the United States. I think it is possible if the United States government wish, and in that case... A charismatic Fidel Castro impressed the idealistic reporter. From her room at the Riviera Hotel in Havana, Howard wrote Castro a remarkable letter, putting her reputation as a reporter on the line. My dearest Fidel, after thinking about it very seriously, I've decided to give you the most valuable possession I have to offer. My faith in the form of a letter, which, if revealed, would destroy me in the United States. Men like you lift us up out of our apathy, our despair, our resignation. I feel deeply that you must be permitted to play out your role, and if I can be privileged to help you, I shall do all in my power to achieve this end. Castro, interview and comment. And Broadcast on ABC Nationwide, Lisa Howard's interview with Castro earned her critical praise. But she had other ambitions. She wanted to change the nature of relations between the U.S. and Cuba. She was eager for a rapprochement between Cuba and the United States. She thought it was a very important thing. She thought that it was possible to do it at that time. Secretly, she went to Richard Helms, deputy director of the CIA, with a message for the president. Helms summed up Howard's position. Howard definitely wants to impress the U.S. government with two facts. Castro is ready to discuss rapprochement, and she herself is ready to discuss it with him if asked to do so by the U.S. government. On the corner of the report, the letters PSAW, meaning President Saw, leaving no doubt that Kennedy himself read the memo. But Lisa Howard was impatient for more concrete action. She felt that Castro deserved more attention and more respect, and that the, the alienation and the isolation of Cuba was ridiculous and that the Kennedy administration should be building a bridge. In September, Howard approached William Atwood, an American diplomat at the UN. She had an audacious plan. 
to use her Manhattan apartment for a meeting between Atwood and the highest ranking Cuban official in the United States, the Cuban ambassador to the UN. It was too controversial to do in public. In doing that, she became a very constructive opportunity for the United States government to be able to communicate with Castro because she knew a lot and she had access. Today we may have reached a pause in the Cold War. On September 20th, while on an official visit to the UN, Kennedy secretly authorized the discussions at Howard's apartment. Howard approached the Cuban ambassador, Carlos Lechuga. He knew her well. First of all, Lisa Howard was a pretty woman, so that's why I started talking to her. She was a very active journalist with a lot of contacts among UN diplomats. I knew she had been in Cuba to interview Fidel. It was at the delegates' lounge that she approached me to say an American representative wanted to talk to me. I said, of course, I'm willing to talk to anybody. That night, American diplomat William Atwood and Lashuga got together at a cocktail party at Howard's apartment. The first thing that happened was I got a hug from Lisa Howard. The second thing that happened was she gave me a whiskey, which I drank. It was a very nice function. I chatted with some of the people there. But soon Atwood took me over to a corner and we started to talk. I'll tell you what Atwood told me. Kennedy thought it was time to change things with Cuba. There were a lot of people who were against this notion, including the State Department. I assume the Pentagon and CIA were also opposed. What they wanted was a military invasion of Cuba. A secret meeting was planned. Provisional arrangements were made for Atwood to go to Cuba in December 1963 and uh, meet possibly with Castro, certainly with the foreign secretary. A flurry of messages passed through Lisa Howard. Two weeks later, Castro left a phone message at her apartment. He was eager to move things ahead. Lisa Howard had created an extraordinary opportunity, sparking a dialogue between Cuba and the United States. Unusual avenues of communication were opening up. American diplomat William Atwood arranged a secret meeting between President Kennedy and Jean Daniel, a young French reporter on his way to meet Fidel Castro. Kennedy wanted Daniel to personally communicate his desire for reconciliation with Cuba. When I left the Oval Office of the White House, I had the impression that I was a messenger of peace. I was convinced that Kennedy wanted rapprochement. That he wanted me to come back and tell him, Castro wishes for rapprochement too. One of the messages Kennedy entrusted with John Daniel was to point out to Castro that he was giving a speech in which Castro would be very much interested. On November 19th, Kennedy spoke in Miami. He was communicating directly with Castro. For once Cuban sovereignty has been restored, we will extend the hand of friendship and assistance to a Cuba in the speech, Kennedy said two conditions were met if the Cuban government would sever its ties to the Soviet Union and stop promoting subversion in Latin America. Then he, he said everything will be possible. We were told Kennedy was going on a short trip to Dallas. And when he returned, he would want to know the status of our dialogue. On November 22nd, 
1963, Kennedy arrived in Dallas. I was part of a four-man pool of reporters. We flew with the president on Air Force One. When we got to Dallas, he worked the crowds, shook a lot of hands. Kennedy, I sometimes tell people, was the most charming male I ever encountered. He uh, oozed charisma. In Cuba, it was a beautiful day. Jean Daniel was telling Castro about his meeting with Kennedy. He listened to me intently. He was drinking in my words. I had the feeling it was all new to him. Clearly, he was happy about the message I was delivering. Sometimes he'd say, maybe he has changed. Maybe things are possible with this man. And I said to myself, Castro has been disappointed by the Russians. Kennedy feels that he has just barely avoided a terrible nuclear world war. These two men seemed ready to make peace. I am certain about this. Certain. Even after all these years. In Dallas, it was 1225. The motorcade was passing Dealey Plaza. We saw this rather odd sign, Texas School Book Depository, on the building ahead of us. And we were wondering about that, what uh, was that building when the first shots were fired. In Cuba, it was lunchtime. They had brought this big, freshly caught fish as a gift of Fidel Castro. In the middle of the meal, a phone call. Fidel Castro gets up, and we hear him say, he has been seriously wounded, but we don't know who he's talking about. When we got to the hospital, the, heart of the car screeched to a halt, we jumped out, and uh, we stood there knowing nothing about what had happened. Then Castro says, President Kennedy has been seriously wounded. There's a silence. Then Castro says, this is terrible. They are going to say we did it. I asked a Secret Service man whom I knew if the president was alive. He replied, we don't know. This is from the Associated Press. We finally find a Florida radio station. They are describing what happened in Dallas. The car, John Kennedy falling, and next to him, his wife. And after a while, Castro says, this is disgusting. They have no decency. They are describing how the blood is running on his wife's stockings. that President Kennedy is dead. Tout d'un coup, and suddenly, Kennedy is dead. Il me dit donc, then Castro says, la fin de votre this is the end of your mission. La fin de ma mission. I was thinking exactly the same thing. In the days that followed, Lisa Howard covered a nation in mourning and a president's funeral. As one goes back over the events of today, one's mind returns again and again to Mrs. Kennedy. She has conducted herself with such extraordinary composure, courage, dignity. That it's all Howard interviewed Cuban ambassador Carlos Lechuga. The news of the tragic death of President Kennedy. My reaction was that we had lost an opportunity to stabilize the relationship with the United States. It was the first time the United States had initiated a dialogue with Cuba to try and resolve our differences. Historically, it was very important. Later on, there were no more opportunities like this one. President Kennedy was, and still is, the only American president 
that had the courage of considering establishing a completely different relationship with Cuba. And uh, for that, you need a lot of courage, especially at that time. The new president, Lyndon Johnson, felt politically vulnerable on the issue of Cuba. White House advisor Gordon Chase summed up the new political climate. A new president, who has no background of being successfully nasty to Castro and the communists, would probably run a greater risk of being accused by the American people of going soft. Johnson didn't want to pursue the dialogue because there was an election coming up. He didn't want to be attacked by the Republicans. And there it ended. As always, U.S. domestic politics influences this issue. But Fidel Castro still wanted to reach out to the United States. And Lisa Howard remained determined to help him. Just three months after Kennedy's assassination, Lisa Howard returned to Cuba to make a new documentary. It was a look at Cuban life after the revolution and an intimate portrait of Fidel. Howard even hinted at the secret negotiations that were gaining momentum before Kennedy was killed. That you believed that under Kennedy, it was going to be possible to normalize relations between Cuba and the United States. What led you to believe that? Um, I don't want to make a speculation about that. But we had, como se dice symptom? Some evidence that something was taking place in the government of the United States. Lisa Howard had become much more than a journalist. Lisa didn't want to be on the outside looking in. Power was the, the aphrodisiac for her. Um, she wanted to be in the center where it was happening, while it was going on. She wanted to make a difference. Together, Fidel and Lisa wrote a message for the new American president, hoping he would pick up where Kennedy had left off. I believe there are no areas of contention between us that cannot be settled with a climate of mutual understanding. But first, of course, it is necessary to discuss our differences. I now believe that this hostility between Cuba and the United States is both unnatural and unnecessary, and it can be eliminated. Howard hoped to get the letter directly to President Johnson. But back in the United States, she found that enthusiasm had cooled, and her influence at the White House was waning. Her former advocate, Gordon Chase, wrote, while I'm in favor of having a channel to Castro, I would feel somewhat safer if we could find a way to remove Lisa from direct participation in the business of passing messages. Lisa was frozen out. Once Kennedy died, I had the feeling from Lisa that she was whew, back to you know, zero in, in White House connection. But Lisa would reinvent herself again. She surprised everyone by heading a committee of Democrats opposed to outsider Robert Kennedy's bid for the New York Senate seat. Her priority list was, was reorganized. And the next big passion of her life was the Democrats for Keating's, opposing Robert Kennedy's candidacy for the Senate. And that overwhelmed everything else. And she laid everything on the line for that one. Howard ignored warnings to distance herself from the campaign, and ABC subsequently fired her. Lisa was angry and bitter at being let go by ABC. She seemed to have not believed they would ever really do it. 
but of course they were a lot more powerful than she was, and they did it, but it depressed her. It made her uncertain in a way that she had never been before. She took refuge in her family and became pregnant with her third child, but it wasn't enough to give her peace. Howard was committed to Mount Sinai Hospital for depression. She was in deep trouble. She was emotionally a very sick and disturbed woman. So I think that's how she lost it. I think she broke down. While in the hospital, she had a miscarriage. She was moved to the maternity ward. They had taken a woman who was unstable on medication and who had just lost a child and put her on the maternity floor of the hospital. It was like a nightmare. And she, first thing she said to me when I came in, she said, I hear babies crying all the time. They bring the babies into the mothers and my baby's dead. Released from the hospital for the weekend, Howard went out to the Hamptons with her family. It was a place where she had always been able to relax and be happy. Those times on the beach in the sun, we were youngish people, a lot of laughs, a lot of fun. You saw her as a much more relaxed human being than the working woman, Lisa. Those were lovely days. Lisa's pain was more serious than anyone had thought. Slipping away from her family, she swallowed a hundred sleeping pills. She died before they got her to the hospital. Her suitcase was on the bed and I lifted the top of the suitcase up. She hadn't brought any clothes with her. She had nothing in her suitcase. It was empty. She had, had to have had this plan. The Riviera Hotel, where Lisa Howard tried to change history, is still in Havana. John F. Kennedy and Lisa Howard are now dead. But Fidel Castro lives on the longest serving head of state in the world. And Cuba is frozen in time. With the same leader, the same cars, the same buildings as 1960. And the promise of that moment when Lisa Howard helped bring the United States and Cuba to the verge of reconciliation seems far away. As Fidel Castro has said, We've grown used to being enemies. But what if Kennedy had not been assassinated? Could things have been different? Yes, of course it could have been different. We could have had a civilized, normal relationship with the United States. Terrorism against Cuba could have been stopped. We could have had free trade with the United States for the mutual benefit of both countries. American citizens could have come to Cuba whenever they wanted. There could have been tourism on both sides. So we lost many opportunities. I think if Kennedy had had a second term, he would have entered the embargo, he would have drowned Castro's revolution in a flood of American tourists, American investors, and American consumer goods. And Castro would have retired to Galicia in Spain and lived through a ripe old age. <laughs> 